someone will have to go and narrate the entire first hour of our of our time back to the at the end of the recording. So someone just stay on at the end and read all I the have notes. copious notes. I'll read my notes. There you go. So um, right. So you see how that works, right? You see how that works with pre-listing packages and having someone else deliver it. You see the impact it makes, right? You see that you're you're actually gaining more points along the way so that when you show up, you, you're already kind of already the one because they, they, they decided to see three people. Nope, nobody else even decided to send anything ahead of time, never mind hire a courier service to arrive on their front porch. And here's the time frame. And then I'll come to Denise's question. The time frame best practice is that should arrive within a half of a business day from when you set the appointment a half a business day from when you set the appointment. So if you set the appointment at 1030 in the morning, by dinner time, that package should have arrived at their house. If you set the appointment in the afternoon, three or 330 in the afternoon, by lunchtime the next, the next day, that package should arrive. So within a half a business day, someone else should be delivering your package to the, pro to the property. Here's, here's why that's so important. What happens to the seller is this. They're on the phone with you. They say, okay, great, you know, thank you for that. We'll look forward to our appointment coming uh, you know, this, this Saturday. Excellent, thank you, goodbye. They hang up and ding dong, the front doorbell rings. And if you can get it there within half a business day, that's what it feels like to them. Even though it's not realistically hang up, ding dong, within a half a business day, that's what it feels like. Think about how important that makes them feel. Think about the urgency that they now get to step back and say, wow, this person's like on the ball. Here's the other thing they think. My goodness, did I call the right person? Because they clearly do this all the time. Because somebody who doesn't do this all the time, somebody who doesn't, isn't a full-time dedicated real estate professional, wouldn't have somebody something delivered at my door within hours of me setting the appointment. So it sends all of those messages before you've even arrived at the house. Do you see the, the value and the importance of all that? Crazy, crazy, crazy important. Denise, go ahead. I was just wondering, it sounds like um, emailing is, is doing, emailing the pre-listing package is perhaps doing ourselves a disservice because we don't have the opportunity to show value as you're describing. Yeah, and so that's a, it's a really great question. Thank you so much for asking it. And, and here's my opinion about that. My opinion is if you're going to email it, email it after you've delivered the package, do both. Don't do the emailing instead of, have that package delivered, know it was delivered. And then once you know it was delivered, you can send a follow-up and the follow-up could say, hey, I know I sent you an actual uh, um, um, hard copy package. A lot of the marketing um, examples will be far more effective in that hard copy package. However, for ease of reading or ease of whatever, I also wanted to send this PDF of most of the package along to you as well. I kind of love that idea as a follow-up to them receiving the actual hard copy package because now you're kind of bookending it. If there's somebody who appreciates technology use more, well, you're not leaving them out. So I like the idea of, of sending both. Make sense? All righty. Now, one last thing before we move on from pre-listing packages. You have to decide how much wow factor you're going to build into these packages. I will tell you, I have done very little to no wow factor and I've gone all the way on the other side to a lot of wow factor. What do I mean by wow factor? I mean, a lot of the, dis the, the, the discussion of what you include from earlier was really about documents, right? The marketing examples are, are kind of extra, but even, even those are kind of printed on harder cardstock. So it's all just kind of a document-based conversation. 
at some point I decided that the wow factor was really important and started to build something bigger and, and more unique than just delivering a package of documents. Certainly, you know, you can bind the documents together. We, at one point um, on my sales team, we actually bound the books. We would have five different books that would circulate and we, because uh, the whole thing was, was professionally printed. You can do it now with companies like um, uh, Shutterfly or things like that, really quite, quite simply and, and, uh, and easily. Back when I was doing it, you, it cost a, it cost a fortune, right? Five of those books, it was like, okay, we need to have at least a closing to pay for those five books. But now it's, it's so easy and simple and cheap. Oh, you just kind of submit it online and Shutterfly delivers it to you in less than uh, a couple of days, right? So, you, so what we did was we, we customized it, made it like a professional bound book. And then the cover letter just went on top of that. And then we kind of put that into a basket and the basket had other stuff in it. The basket had a balloon on it. The basket had a big cardboard cut out of, of a key. And that's how we asked for the seller homework for the, for the keys that was in there. There was always a snack. There was, you know, popcorn or there was, um, or there was M&Ms. I was big on M&Ms. Here's one thing I learned. M&Ms don't work all that well in the summer because they, they end up with a bag of, of melted chocolatey mush if you leave them outside, if you leave the basket outside. Right, so have a, have a summer version of, of something non-chocolate. Uh, if, if I knew that the, they, they had kids, we had, we had um, coloring books and crayons. You know, we started with just dollar store stuff and then we had some design that were custom, that were real estate related. And then once we, once we did that, we thought, you know what, what a waste of money that is. We're going back to the dollar store and just buying, buying that. They didn't have to be so fancy, but it was the thought that counted. It was the, the package arrives and there's something for the kids to do, right? If we knew that they had dogs, how do you know that? Sometimes you're on the phone making the appointment and the dogs start to bark, right? I would make a note. And if they had dogs, I would send along, you know, dog biscuits or a, or, or a chew toy or something like that in the pre-listing basket, right? So the wow factor started to build and it seemed more custom and it seemed more deliberate and specific to the family that I was delivering it to. We used to do like cutesy things. We'd get stuff at the dollar store. We would, we would, um, we would have um, dice and the, the conversation would be, you know, don't leave the sale of your home to the roll of the dice. Sometimes we would buy um, dollar scratch offs and put those in the, in the pre-listing package. And the, the conversation right you know, a little card that went with that was, you know, does, uh, does this, does the sale of your home always feel like, um, don't, don't leave this, don't leave the successful sale of your home to chance. Right. And so they had, they got the dollar scratch offs, stuff like that. Right. Which just kind of sets you apart. It, it has the seller kind of think, you know what, this person, this person knows what they're doing. They know what they're talking about. They, they think outside of the box. They think outside of the basket, as it were, right? We, we would sometimes, if the, if the seller client would give us permission to deliver the pre-listing package to their place of business, we would ask them for that, uh, for that permission. And if they said yes, we would get really fancy and it would be flowers and balloons. And so, you know, when, when you're in an office environment and someone gets a big bouquet of flowers, everyone walks by and was like, oh, ooh, who's that for? Who's it from, right? Because everybody's nosy, they wanna know. Imagine having your pre-listing package arrive at the front desk and everybody in that organization walk past or have it go to, you know, Maria's desk or Jim's desk. And then people are walking past their desk saying, like, who's that from? Oh, it's from, it's from my realtor, right? So there's, there's a whole lot of different ideas that you can start to grow into. Uh, for a while, we used to put our pre-listing stuff into a box and um, the, the top of the box was we got uh, police caution tape. And so we would put the caution tape across the top of the box and we would write in magic marker, caution, the contents of this box may cause your home to sell, right? And so, so then when we stopped doing that, that was the heading of our cover letter. It wasn't, it wasn't a formal you know, letter, 
it was it was in big bold letters across the top of the cover letter caution the contents of this package may cause your home to sell so we just kept playing with those ideas for for a while we would do um we would do the pre-listing package uh in a box and we would cover the pre-listing stuff with hay and the top letter on when you opened the box said does it ever feel like hiring the right realtor is like finding a needle in a haystack well then at the bottom of all the hay was us right and all of our stuff so they had they they did it they, they congratulations you like you found the needle in the haystack we're we're you hire us we're the ones for you so you can make this however big impressive fancy wow factor as you want minimally though you need to have the documentation and some of those examples so that someone is receiving something from you to accomplish the um, introduction, the pre-sell of you, and the save time at the, at the console. But you can see how much fun you can start to have with these things if you really start to think about how you could, how you could build this stuff. So my point to you is this. Don't discount the wow factor. It's not dorky. It's, it, it kind of creates a, a level of, uh, of fun on your side, and it creates a level of wow on the potential seller's side, right? If all it takes to, to win over the listing over one of your competitors is a couple of scratch-offs, like, like why not, right? Denise says the examples prove motivation and innovative marketing. I couldn't agree more, right? Because if I'm, if I'm going out of my way to, to wow them up front, what am I going to do to go out of my way to wow buyers with the presentation of their property? If, if, this, is, if this is how I behave before you've even hired me, imagine what it will feel like once you've actually said yes. Right? That was actually one of my scripts. So, so it's, it's, all of those, it's all of those things. Questions, comments on the pre-listing package? Have we beat that horse good and dead? And here's why we do it. Because I cannot impress upon you enough the importance of that tool. It truly sets apart those who win listing appointments and those who don't. I've done it both ways. I, I can, I'm living proof of how much, how much more yeses you receive faster and without commission conversation, when you are consistent with a powerful pre-listing package. Yes, sir, Robert. So um, quick question. Um, so we don't put in the heat map or anything like that, you said in the pre-listing package, correct? I wouldn't. I mean, let, let's face it, there's no right or wrong to that. However, I think that the, my personal opinion is, again, your superpower is being able to explain the market, help interpret that, that the market. And so all the tools around the market, I believe should be done in person okay. so that they can, so that, that you can involve them in that conversation because that's what wins the listing. Trust me when I tell you, I've been doing this long enough. The, the prettiest brochure does not win the listing. It's what a lot of people focus on, but it's not what sellers ultimately care about. They care about your knowledge and expertise to help guide them to create the best bang for their buck when they put the largest asset they own on the market. And that is all rooted in your market conditions and knowledge of the market, how you help the, how you speak about it, how you help them understand, again, not just what the market is doing, but what drives the market. Let me give you an example of that before we move forward. Before a year ago, I want you to put your, your pre-pandemic hat on, what was happening across the state, especially in Fairfield County, with regards to price points that were selling and price points that weren't selling? Were we in a good spot or a not so good spot pre-pandemic? Uh, not so good spot. We, we were in a not so good spot. The market was very sluggish in our state, especially anything over the median sales price in any given town 
what was just a real struggle. People were putting their houses on the market and they were just sitting. Now, why was that? Part of the reason that that was occurring was because decisions that were being made in Hartford by our, by our previous governor and, and then even some by our current governor were driving companies out of our state. They certainly weren't attracting companies to our state. And so, especially in lower Fairfield County where there were all these uh, companies that used to be in New York and relocated up here because it was still close to New York, were being wooed out of Connecticut by places like New York, trying to get them back, and Boston. And the, the administrations weren't doing anything to keep those companies here. Now, think about the trickle effect, the trickle down effect of that. All of the executives that ran those companies were putting properties above the median sale price in whatever town on the market. The state was attracting additional jobs. Right? And that's what you heard the government talking about. Well, we, we're, we're, we're growing the jobs. Look, the jobs number is up. Except here was the difference. You had high-end people moving out and the jobs they were replacing in the state were not paying what those high-end people were earning. So you were replacing them with lower paying jobs, which means the people moving into the state were buying at or below the median sale price. So everything above the median was still sitting because the, the influx of people weren't in those ranges. So therefore, anything above the median was a real chore in most of our towns and cities to actually get under agreement pre-pandemic. It's almost hard to imagine, right? Because of what we've experienced for the last nine to 12 months. And yet that's what, that's what we came from. Now, is that a different conversation to have with the seller than here are the three comps, here's, here's what the property should go on the market for? Right? It's a very different conversation. You're now showing them that you not only understand the market, but you understand what drives the market. If you were a listing agent for a $950,000 house in, uh, in Ridgefield, right, or a $600,000 house in Bethel, or a you know, million five, million eight property in, in Westport, those were all above the median sale price in, in each of those specific towns you know how a different conversation that you could have to help the seller build a partnership with you and trust that you not only could read, but you understood how to interpret. And what I mean by that is finding comps and putting them on the table shows someone that you know how to read, hmm. right? Here are the three best sold comps. I read them on the MLS. You, you turning that into a conversation about what's driving the marketplace and why at some of those ranges, we need to take far more caution with our positioning than if we were under the, you know, at or below the median in that particular town. That's what people are looking for. That's what people hire because you talk differently than your competition. I'm going to impress upon you at every possible turn, if you can do or sound different than just rote real estate, right? Blah, 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 here's the CMA, blah, blah, blah. Oh my goodness. Who could, like, if people are seeing three, three real estate agents, by the third one, they're ready to jump out the third story window and hope it's high enough to do some damage. Right? Because it's the same conversation. You need to always take a left when your competitors take a right. It's why we, as, as we go through the next couple of days, those of you with some experience, we don't talk about CMAs in this, in this, in this room. We talk about SPAs. What's the main difference? The name, right? We just started calling things different names because we wanted to make sure that we sounded different. The SPA is a strategic positioning analysis. You get to explain that we, you know what, the, working with a CMA with all due respect to anyone who's still using it is kind of like a, 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 an act of the dinosaur, right? That kind of that went out with, I don't know, 
cassette tapes and whatever else, right? Instead, Mr. and Mrs. Seller, we have prepared for you today and would like to review our SPA, which is a strategic positioning analysis. We find that the focus of the strategic positioning analysis is really more beneficial to helping you make the best decision possible based on all the factors that cause the market to move. Do you just, do you just hear that how different that is than here's the CMA, here's the sold, here's the actives, right? Here's the church, here's the steeple, open the doors, here's all the people, right? It's, it, it's that it's a, it, you just sound different. And my experience tells me that when you sound different, you are different in the eyes of the potential client. Alex. So um, Rick, it may be a sidebar, but could we have a conversation about what is that sort of overall, overall big picture um, narrative that you, you know, that that we can have today on today's market as opposed to pre-pandemic as which I actually hadn't heard put quite so clearly and eloquently before. Yeah, and it's it's I won't take credit for it because somebody pre-pandemic probably six to eight months before uh, some mid 2019 or early 2019 emailed me uh, a link to a, a um, an article that was written in the Hartford Courant that that said exactly that, right? And so I just read it and thought, you know what? We need to be teaching this because whoever wrote this understands how the market moves, right? It's, it's why you need to be kind of well-read. You need to stay up on the news. You need to understand what's going on in Hartford, in local government. It, it's, a, it's a bigger picture than just getting on the MLS and looking for comps, right? you have to start, you have to be able to interpret all of that. And when you have that knowledge, right? And what's cool is, you know, Alex will send me something and say, hey, have you seen this? And so if it's important, then we'll broadcast it on a 9 a.m. Zoom or we'll push it out via email. You know, Donna will send me something. Patrick comes into the office and says, you know what I just heard, is that true? How, how does that affect us? And so when we all are looking, the, the, the team, here, I wore this shirt for you today. What does it say? Can you see it? That's a nice move, Rick. One team, right? That's my KW shirt for the day. But when we are one team and we all move and operate as one team, each and every one of us doesn't have to be brilliant. We can each be on the lookout for those kinds of things and then just deliver them in and then we kind of rebroadcast them. Right, it's the, it's the power of size and it's the, it's the power of unity. It's the power of, of team, right? It's, and it's, it's uh, I think it's an important distinction um, and, a, and a real plus that we have in our organization because for the most part, that's how people think, right? And so Alex's question is a really good one. Can we talk about what that looks like today? The answer is yes. Tomorrow when we go through, it'll be tomorrow uh, when we go through pricing, I'm going to give you all of the things that I look for and why and how I, how I interpret it. I, I literally just did this last Thursday with a seller. One of, uh, one of your colleagues asked me to get on a Zoom with a seller who was, who was really struggling with a, a price reduction. And so I'll use that one as an example and we'll just kind of walk through it so you, you can see what numbers I think are important and why and how I explain it. Would that be helpful? Cool beans. Okay. Whew. All righty. So where are we at? Ah, oh, yes. So here's what I'd like to do. I'd like to, we're, we're going to skip a step and a half, if that's all right. We've kind of gone through the conversation of the pre-listing package. My hope is that you see the power of that pre-listing package and how kind of non-negotiable it is as a listing agent, right? So, and again, you, your homework, if you don't have one of those, you by this time next week, you need to have one. So, so you can jot down homework for Ignite is build and bring to next Tuesday's call, 
my pre-listing package. We'll maybe set aside a little time for some show and tell, right? But, but build it. Because here's the thing, if you don't, if I don't set a deadline to it, too many of you will say, well, you know what, I, I'll get to it. But as I said before, getting to it, I've seen the results of that a year later. And then you're still, you're still so, so overloaded with buyers and you haven't made that transition to the list side of things, right? So be certain that you get on purpose about that. Hey, did Debbie, sh did, did Debbie show you? I'm going to get there in just half a second, Diane. Did Debbie show you at three o'clock today where to go for the foundational uh, tools and designs? Yes, sir. Okay, good. So, so you have that. I'm assuming that I know that was recorded. So if you missed it, you can go back and watch the recording. It'll be on the YouTube channel uh, by tomorrow morning. So you can go and check that out and see where those, uh, where those foundational tools are to start with. So you don't have to start from scratch. Yes, Diane. Yeah, I was just wondering, um, I have a, um, you know, a pre-listing presentation. I have like two actually. And, you know, with the information I've got from command and, you know, various emails that I, you know, attachments that I got from Jen. And I just don't know how to make that be my brand. You know, I don't know. Um, you know, I don't know which one is right. You know, I, I have a, I have a couple for the buyers and a couple for the sellers, and you know, I just, I, I just want some direction on, you know, what, what do you think is is clean and simple, or more information is better, or. Um, uh, yeah. So, so I think my personal opinion is that less is more. Um, my personal opinion is. In I, I don't. I don't believe that these tools are your brand. I think that your brand is your brand, and that your brand can show up on these tools. Uh, so, so I think. I think the, from a branding perspective, they're two different. They're two different things. Um, I do believe less is more. I think that a, a, a powerful pre-listing package should be no long, no more than eight to ten, maybe twelve pages long. With some, with some marketing examples thrown in for good measure. More than that, they're not going to read anyway, right? Keep things as bullet pointed as possible, except maybe the cover letter, which should only be about a paragraph or two and double spaced. Because if it looks too, if it looks too crowded, people don't read. And they'll, they'll open it and say, oh, this is gonna take too much time or it's gonna hurt my eyes, so therefore I'm gonna put it down. So make it easy for them to digest. I, I, I neglected to say one other thing uh, that Diane's question reminded me of. I would be cautious, especially if you come from a company that is that that um, um, if you come from a company that has decided that their brand is the reason that you are successful. Right. There, there, there are a number of traditional model real estate companies out there. And I don't mean this as a judgment. It's just true. I used to I, I've lived inside of them and used to used to be an agent inside of some of them. Right. Traditional model real estate uh, companies oftentimes believe and then require that their brand is your brand. Right. And 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 what they teach a lot of times is that you are successful because our brand is successful. Right. If you've been in my presence for more than 12 and a half minutes, you know that I, I, I do not believe that at all. That is so true. I do not believe that you are successful because you are affiliated with Keller Williams Realty. I believe that Keller Williams Realty is successful because you are affiliated with Keller Williams Realty. Right. I believe that the success comes from you. It doesn't come from us. We're just we're just the support system that powers and supports your business. Your business is your business. And so the thing that I want to mention, and I, and I forgot, so Diane, thank you for reminding me about it. Be careful that you, and it's, it's easy if you're newer in the business to think, well, I don't have a lot to share, so I'm going to lean heavily on all the KW stuff. Here's what my experience tells me. Most sellers, save for maybe a mention about the fact that you, you do work for a, a, a globally recognized brand, right? And that, that, can be, that can be handled in the cover letter 
or in one little snapshot of, and the, the way I would do it is to make sure that people understand that Keller Williams Realty is a worldwide organization and we have reach into 51 different countries plus Canada and, and, uh, and the United States. More than that, don't heavy up on the KW stuff because people are interested in hiring you. They're not interested in hiring a company, right? They called you. If they were interested in hiring Keller Williams Realty, they would have called the front desk and asked me my opinion about who, who should, could come to the house. That's not how it works most of the time. They call you because they know you or were referred to you or you made outreach. They're interested in speaking to you and the importance of you presenting you powered underneath and supported by what we have to offer your business is a, a major distinction. People don't hire companies, they hire other people. And so make sure that, that your, you, your tools that we're talking about don't get too heavy. I've seen people make the mistake of like putting in all this stuff about KW. I know it was started in this thing it's in, and here's, here's where all the offices are and here's what we stand for and here's all this. Well, if you also stand for those things, well then great, maybe, maybe make the stand that here are my values, here's what I stand for. But don't, don't dump all this KW heavy stuff in there because you then, you then run the risk of not creating a personal connection with the client who is looking to make a personal connection with you to say yes and hire you. Do, do you see how that could work, could backfire on you? I've seen, it, I've seen it happen too many different times. Again, and I've lived in organizations where that was, that was what was taught and, and, and some, in some organizations that that was required, right? I lived in an organization where their name and logo had to be a certain size and mine had to be 25% of that you know, it couldn't be bigger than, oh my goodness, I was always in trouble in that organization. Always in trouble. Because the rules just made no sense to me. I'm like, okay, I'm developing my own business and my own brand. Why? So I, I would make things with my brand and then, you know, underneath powered by, I won't tell you who it was, Century 21, but it was that, right? And at some point, just a, a quick aside, um, the head of North American marketing for the Century 21 brand happened to move to Ridgefield, Connecticut, where I lived and had my business. And so everything that I did was seen by that person. And so the broker of my office was constantly getting calls from the head of corporate marketing who happened to live up the street saying, okay, what are they doing? Like, why are you allowing this? It barely says Century 21. What are those colors they're using? Those are not Century 21 colors. Well, because I refuse to use that horrible yellowy, goldy color, right? So my point, understand that you live inside of an organization that allows you and, and encourages you to brand you. Don't make the mistake of not taking advantage of that. Right? Even if you feel like you don't have a lot to offer yourself, call me. I, I will talk you through how you can build that, that local brand, that, that you brand up, and have it just simply be powered by or supported underneath by, by the, global, the global. The reality is we are the largest real estate company in the world. Right, That's just a simple fact. So you can mention that. That's, that kind of gives people a, um, some, some security. More than that, it needs to be about you. Okay. Perfect answer. I'm glad, I'm glad. And I, I hope what you recognize is that it, 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 that's, not, that's, not a, that's not a talking heads answer. I, I believe that answer. Frankly, I wouldn't be sitting here. I wouldn't have moved from where I was to open the very first real estate, the very first Keller Williams office in the state of Connecticut 17 years ago, if I didn't believe that. Because that alone is how I chose to run my own business. And it's what drove me out of traditional model real estate. 
And when I looked around, the only place that I could go that would allow me to do the things that I wanted to do the way I wanted to do it was a brand that nobody had ever heard of, including me. And it happened to be this one, right? So I'm just so, I'm so grateful that I, that, that, that we went on a search and found it and that so many people think like I do to say, you know what, this is actually what I'm looking for in terms of growing my business. Cause it makes a really big difference. It makes a really big difference. Okay. So what I, where I was going was kind of skipping a half a step and the half a step I'm going to skip is a larger conversation around that, that kind of first step at the house where you're, kind of going around and checking the house out. I promise I will come back to that, but I wanna move into our scripts and get at least through the first couple of pages before we break for the evening. And so what I'd like to do is jump into the scripts that were sent to you yesterday. It's called Mastering the Listing Consultation. And that very first page actually happens prior to that conversation, that, that, that consultation. Let me pause a second and say this. If you live in my world, you don't ever say listing presentation. You always say listing consultation because they are two very different things. And again, I can tell you, I, 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 was, I was brought up in real estate. I was taught a presentational style. Until I learned differently that consultate, consultative style is far more efficient and effective. So for me, you're always going to hear me talk about going on a listing consultation. Because when you consult as partners with the potential sellers, guess what? They say yes far more often than they do if you just go and do the Carol Merrill version, you know, here's presentation, here's behind curtain one, here's what's behind curtain two. Presentations have you talking and talking and talking and showing and talking and talking and talking. Consultations have you asking a bunch of questions and engaging the potential seller at a really high level, modeling partnership from the minute you meet them by involving them in the conversation, by involving them in the decision-making process, by making certain that they understand that you are there for one purpose and one purpose alone, and that is to serve them at the highest level by interpreting current conditions such that they can make the best business decision possible. Right? That was the definition of your job description I gave you two and a half, two weeks ago. To interpret current conditions such that the client can make the best decision possible. That doesn't go away here. If you walk in and start yapping away about why you're so wonderful and why they should list with you, what does that have to do with interpreting current conditions such that they can make the best decision possible? I would argue it has almost nothing to do with that. It has to do with ego. Sometimes it has to do with nerves, right? Because if you don't know enough about what else you should be talking about, sometimes talking about your awards or your last closing or your whatever is what you default to, right? That's just, that's, that's a, it's, a, it's human. It doesn't make you bad or wrong. It just makes you human. However, when you're cognizant of it, you need to continue to take that turn and pivot towards consultation. Remember, if you are talking more than they are, you should write this down because this is kind of a, a fascinating um, idea. And I can't remember, frankly, where I learned it. And yet I've, I've determined that it is a truth. The person who walks away from a conversation having spoken the most feels as though that conversation went the best. Well, I want you to think about that. If that person is you because you spoke the most, you're now walking away thinking that went great. 
But the other side of that coin is also true. That means that the potential seller is walking away feeling like it wasn't as great. You feel like it went better than they did. So be cautious around that. If, they walk, if they've spoken the most, well, then they get to walk away feeling like it went the best. Do you see how that's a far easier opportunity to close for a listing to actually get hired than when you walk away thinking, oh, man, that went so well, I slayed that. And they're like, mm, yeah, we need to think about it. Did you ever wonder why sometimes when you feel like you just absolutely crushed it, they say, I need to think about it? It could be because you feel like you crushed it because you did all the talking and you kind of left them out. People want to be included. People want to be heard. Basic human emotion. If you can fulfill that during a listing consultation, again, you've now set yourself apart. You sound different. Boy, he keeps asking questions and questions that are, that really make us think. He doesn't just agree with everything we say, right? Are you that kind of listing agent? Uh-huh, uh-huh. Oh yes, absolutely. Whatever you say, uh-huh. Oh, listed for $75,000 higher than what I look. Uh-huh, sure, uh-huh, uh-huh. Right? That's not partnership. That's not consultation. I'm not sure what that is, frankly. So always come at this from the consultative perspective. Always remember that, that the person who drives the bus is the person who is asking the questions. Right? That's, how you, that's how you stay in control of the consult. It's how you make sure that you get to where you need to go because you're the one who's working A from a script and asking those questions. So let's, let's start the night before you actually bring them into the office for this consult. And yes, I would, I would say that at this point, unless the seller client is um, really resistant to it, I would say start bringing them back into the office, right? If you haven't done that. I love Zoom as a, as a medium to get this done. It is oftentimes more convenient for all players. And yet it can also create a level of disconnect, right? It's not quite as personal as being in person. And I want you to remember, you are always, every single one of you on this call, you're always more powerful in person than you are not. I find that, that you know, it, it, even with humor, like when I tell a joke on Zoom, they just don't land as well as when I'm in the classroom, right? So what I'm saying is I'm far funnier than what you're experiencing. No, I'm kidding. So, but, but, it, but it's true, you're more powerful in person. And then the, the, the once removed on that is via Zoom. Twice removed on that is now via phone. Three times removed is now via either text or email, right? Your power just kind of diminishes. So utilize that power, utilize you as a, as a presence. And so if, again, my suggestion is if there's a, a comfort level that the seller has, invite them into the office. Make sure you're meeting them here, right? There's a lot of power to that. It also shows them that you don't live out of your car, right? That you actually have a home and there's a bricks and mortar, something or other. Depending on when you might be in the office, other people might be around. So you have help if you need it. You have, you have tools, you have computers, you have presentation rooms, right? Or consultation rooms with presentation equipment. You have copy machines, you have scanners, you have, you have everything at your disposal. And best of all, you don't have distraction. For those of you who, who continue to go to somebody's house for that, for that listing consult, I'm gonna tell you, I gave that up a really long time ago, except in, in, in circumstances where someone is you know, uh, elderly or really infirm where they really can't get out of the house, uh, we'll make those exceptions. But for all other purposes, you gotta come visit me because the distractions that exist inside someone's home, they're enough to drive you to drink. Right. 
the kids, the pets, the, the, the cleaning ladies there, the whatever's going on. I had a guy once who I'm sitting at his dining room table and the phone kept ringing and he kept getting up and answering it. Oh, just, you know, excuse me one second. Excuse me one second. By the third time he did it, by the time he got back into the dining room, I had packed my stuff up and said, you know what? It was so lovely to meet you. This clearly is not a good time. Why don't you give me a call and we can reset the appointment at a time that's more convenient for us both. And he looked at me, he said, well, what, what, you're leaving? And he said, well, we're not really accomplishing anything with all the phone calls that you're getting. So yeah, I'm gonna, I'm gonna say again, thank you so much for your time. I would love to reschedule this at a time that's more convenient. I didn't get that listing. And you know what? I was okay with that. That was a choice I made. Because I thought to myself, if this guy is going to behave so absolutely rudely to me before he even knows who I am and decides to hire me, imagine what I'm going to experience once he thinks I owe him something because he's hired me. Once he gets to know me and, and the honeymoon's like over. How am I going to be treated then? Right? Remember this. You should write this down. When people show you who they are, believe them. Just trust that. This guy was showing me who he was right up front. Like, you know what? Okay, thank you. I, I so appreciate knowing who you are before I have to waste a whole lot of time. And here's the follow-up to that. For those of you who are thinking, wow, what an idiot. Why would he walk out? Like, what a baby. Why can't he just like, man up and, and just suck it up. Again, is a choice that I made. And I knew that I was going back to my office to a lead generation and conversion funnel that was full of people who wouldn't disrespect me, who wouldn't be rude and keep taking phone calls. Now, clearly, you know, if he said, you know, look, my my, my, my wife is at the hospital, our, our little one, you know, fell and is getting stitches and I'm so sorry. But no, it, it was just, and he'd leave for like five or six minutes at a time. Like, where is this person? Like, where? By the third time I had had enough. If your lead generation and conversion pipeline is full enough, you get to make those choices. You don't have to work with the jerks. You get to pick and choose. And that was just a simple choice that I made in my business. Here's the thing though. If your source of business isn't clear, if you don't have a lead generation strategy fully at work in your business, if you are not constantly building the muscle of conversion and pushing towards that appointment number that we set every single week, you can't afford to walk away from that. And here's how I know. Because in the early part of my career, when nobody told me you actually had to spend time on client acquisition first, I wouldn't have walked away. Because I knew if I walked away, I wasn't going back to a, a full funnel of other opportunities. So I put myself in positions that too many of us sometimes just accept. All right, we're down a different bunny trail now. So let's do this. In our 11 minutes remaining, let's kind of run through the script for confirming the appointment the night before. So quickly, before we read through this script, I will offer to you that you shouldn't be making this call either. This is another opportunity that you have to leverage and barter with someone else. Maybe your spouse, if they have a great voice that can, can do it. Maybe, maybe one of your children, right? As long as they're like teenagers or above. I'm not sure you want to have like your eight-year-old call the, call the appointment the night before to confirm. I think that probably is a little risky, right? Or you barter back and forth. So Patrick makes my calls the night before and I make his, right? But have somebody else do it to continue the idea that you have people for that and to prevent having to have part of the consultation on the phone the night before. Same reasons as why you have somebody else deliver the pre-listing package. All right, who wants to walk us through this real quick? 
Somebody read us, read this through, and I will be the person you're calling. We only have nine minutes, so somebody decide to be the agent. I promise it's not big. Okay, thank you, Patrick. I, so I'll just ring, 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 ring. Hello. Hi, good afternoon, uh, Mr. Scott. This is assistant calling from uh, Scott's, uh, Scott Leroy's, um, sorry, uh, from Keller use, Williams. Yeah, just using any agent. Okay. How are you doing today? I'm doing great, thank you. Good, good. I was just calling to confirm your appointment uh, with Patrick for tomorrow at 4 p.m. in our office uh, at uh, 277 um, Summer Street in Stanford. Um, I'm looking forward to meeting with you to discuss the sale. Patrick, look forward to meeting with you to discuss the sale of your home and wondering if uh, there was any specifics that you uh, want to be certain that he covers. Um. Well, that's a, so, so yes, I can confirm the appointment and I, I'm assuming that the conversation will address the, the pricing of my, of my house. Uh, yeah, yeah. Um, perfect. I'll, I'll, I'll let him know. Um, were you able to review Pat's pre-listing uh, package that was delivered to you? Um, you? You know what? I think we, yes, we did. We did review that. Thank you. Uh, did you have any questions about that package? Uh, no, not really. Okay, were you able to uh, complete some of the seller homework that he sent uh, sent you? Oh yeah, we we got right on that. I mean, like minutes after it arrived, okay, that's all done. Great, great. Uh, Pat looks forward to uh, to reviewing those with you and his meeting to tomorrow um, to list your home tomorrow. Great. Um, he's he's excited to meet with you and looks forward to the meeting tomorrow at four p.m. In the meantime, if there's anything that we can do uh, for you, please do not hesitate to call. Have a great afternoon. Thanks, you as well, bye. Bye. Awesome, thank you so much for that. So what did you notice about that script? It's written very specifically to address a couple of things. What'd you notice? Go ahead, Karen. Well, I uh, thought that it covered all the, all the points, but I also noticed that you were a very easygoing seller. No objections. Well, so I'm wondering what, what objections do you think would occur when you're just calling to confirm the appointment the night before? Oh, I didn't do any of the homework. I, you know. Well, 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 because, and, and here's why. So what I just gave you was what I experienced almost all the time oh. when I got feedback back from, from my assistant who was calling to confirm the appointment. Oh, That's, that's how sellers sound the night before because most sellers haven't done the homework. Most sellers haven't reviewed the package, but they do lie to you and say yes. Oh, I see, okay, got it. Right, and what happens is the reason that paragraph, I'm so glad you brought this up, right? Because the reason that paragraph is written in such a way, the, the, the way that it is, is that you want the seller who most of the time, I mean, I'm gonna say like 90% of the time, People haven't looked at it. They haven't. They haven't done the homework. They haven't. They got it. They thought, okay, well, you know, whatever. We'll put it aside. And why? Not because they thought it was stupid. Not because they didn't think it was important. But because people are busy, right? People have a life, and like listing their house is not the be all end all of their life. And one of the things that you have to recognize as a real estate professional is that most people hire you to handle the sale of their home while 774 other things are going on in their life. It's not like the entire world stops and it becomes only about you in real estate for the next three months. And I think sometimes we forget that, right? We get, I called and no one responded. Well, maybe there's, maybe they had to work late, but like they'll call you in the morning, right? It's sometimes we have to like take a breath and recognize that we are a part of their life for that short period of time. We're not their entire life for that short period of time. And so when we ask them, did you review it? Did you have questions? I guarantee you most of the time that person hangs up the phone and says, "Hun, did, so did someone deliver something here last week? We're supposed to have like reviewed it and there's homework in it or something. 
for this thing we're having tomorrow with that realtor. Do you know what he's talking about? That's the conversation after they hang up the phone with the person who just called, right? Eight out of 10 times. But that's another reason we call the night before because we don't ever want them to be wrong, right? We don't want Patrick to arrive at the house and say, hey, did you have any questions from that pre-listing um, uh, package that I sent? Did, did you happen to complete the seller homework? I'd like to review that with you and have them feel stupid or somehow wrong at that moment in time. I'd rather give them the heads up the night before so they can go and scramble and get it and review it and be ready so that they can feel good about their meeting. You see how that works? That makes a lot of sense. And I want you to be really, really clear about the last line in that paragraph. Patrick will look to review those with you when you meet to list your home tomorrow. Mm -hmm. That's another close. It's another assumptive close. Mm -hmm. Patrick's not coming to talk to you about the price of your house. He's coming to list the home tomorrow. We're gonna to make sure that, that we continue to send that message, mm -hmm. right? These are hiring conversations we're having. Mm -hmm. So we're gonna to continue to push that and, and underline that even in the night before confirm the appointment conversation. Make sure that if you're doing this for someone else, you know how you want them to behave. If in fact, when Patrick asked me, is there anything specific you want to be sure that's covered? If I started to ask really well, well, yeah, you know what? And as a matter of fact, can you just give me a heads up on like what the mission is? Can you, you know, have, have you done any work? Has anyone done any work? Are we talking about a house in the sixes or the sevens? Cause you know, my neighbor just sold for like 7.99 and I think I'm better. So I'm really hoping it's gonna be the eights. If, if people get aggressive like that, you have to, you have to make sure that the person calling on your behalf knows how you want that to be handled. I made that mistake. I, I had a full-time assistant at the time and she was in charge of this. And I was never clear with her about what I wanted done if that were to occur. And she thought she was being very helpful by answering a lot of those questions the way she thought I would answer them. Because I was never clear to say, no, 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 if, if that kind of thing happens, take notes, that's why you have what else, right? That's one of the best scripts ever written for a consultant. What else? Ask a question and then what else them until there's nothing else. Got it, I've written that down, what else? What else? Because what else alleviates you from actually answering the question? We're moving things forward. They get to do all the brain dumping that they need to do. And then I simply get to say, thank you so much for that, I will be certain that Patrick has all that information and he will handle all of that with you tomorrow. Right? I don't want the person calling the night before to start answering questions on my behalf. The only time that I want someone to even call me and let me know is if, if, if Patrick called me and I started to say, hey, you know what? I think I'm gonna have to cancel because of X, Y, and Z. Ah, you know what? Thank you for, for letting us know. I know that, I know that Patrick's gonna to wanna to talk to you uh, about that. So let me do this. Let me wish you a good evening. Let me give him a call and do expect his phone call momentarily. Because my assistant was told that if anyone attempted to cancel, that they were to be thanked for their time, told that I was calling, and then I was to be called immediately so that I could get on the phone and find out what was going on. Was this just a, a, a cancellation for a 24 hour period because of X, Y, or Z, because people have, you know, life happened to them? Or was this something slipping out of my hands before I even got there? Make sense? Questions, comments, concerns about the confirming the appointment the night before? Yes, sir, Robert. Side question on this. So. If we send somebody else with the pre-listing and then we do the actual thing in the office, um, when do we see the house to do comps or anything like that? Or, or um, how do we get that information? Yeah, so that's, that's really the, that's the part I said we were just going to skip over. For now, I'm going to come back to it, right? No, sorry. Typically, that's a two-step process. You're going to arrive at the house, 
after the pre-listing package arrives to kind of tour the house with the seller and then set the appointment for the consultation in the office as you leave. But okay. we just skipped over that part. I will come back to it, but I wanted to start diving into the scripts. Uh, awesome. so we, could, we could get through the scripts by the end of the day tomorrow. All right. Uh, all right. I mean, I was just asking because I might have one on Friday. So I think it's yeah. too late to send a pre-listing already. But uh, all right. So that's how it goes. You send a pre-listing. Yeah. Then in between that and the actual the actual one, you squeeze there when you go see the house. Yeah. Your first appointment is to go and, and tour the house if you're doing a two-step. And I would I would encourage you build a pre-listing package tonight and have it delivered tomorrow. Perfect. Don't skip, not, don't skip it's the step. Done. It's not too late. Yeah, and it's actually kind of done, but some of the things that you said today, I have to switch some things around. So perfect. But, all right. Thanks, Rick. You're welcome. Guys, we are out of time. Thank you so much for being here. As always, I, I enjoy spending time with you. And I look forward tomorrow to kind of running through the rest of these scripts. We'll spend a bunch of time on um, pricing and begin by the end of our time tomorrow, we'll begin the anatomy of a seller transaction uh, and we'll, we'll keep pushing through. So have a lovely evening. We will see you tomorrow at four o'clock sharp and uh, sorry, we'll see you tomorrow at four o'clock sharp. Yes. And I think Doug, you asked earlier in the chat, do we have Ignite on Thursday? The answer is uh, yes, we do. So all three days this week, four to six. Um, it is red day. I understand that. And yet uh, I think our projects will be done in enough time that I would like to, uh, I would like to, to meet simply because if we, if we skip Thursday, Oh, wait a minute, this week, this week is not red day. That's next week. So let me take two tonight, Wednesday and Thursday, four to six. I'll see you then. Have a lovely. Thank you, Rick. Bye everybody. Bye. Have a good night. Thanks Rick.